Let's see. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I should have said, we, we're all committed to doing no more than 12 minutes or something, so that we'll have time to talk here and then to open. So one of the messages we've heard today is that conversations are key to providing great care for people with serious illness. And we've heard that these conversations can be challenging. I'm going to talk about the kinds of behaviors that improve these conversations and how we can support those behaviors with simple tools. So as an example of what I mean by conversational behaviors, I'm going to ask all of you a question. Raise your hand if you've ever had a loved one talk to you about a stressful situation they experienced at work. Good, you can put your hands down. Okay, so while we're focused today on people with serious illness, I want to avoid putting people like that in a box. The reality is that just about every one of us is going to find ourselves in situations where we talk about serious illness at some point in our lives, and probably many times. So let me share a little bit of research that will be relevant to everybody who raised their hand. Studies show that when spouses discuss work stress, there are clear patterns that lead to satisfaction for both people. If one spouse brings up stress at work and the other responds with advice, <laughs> it is usually not received well. So usually what happens, and the study shows this, is that the spouse expressing the problem tries to end the conversation and move on to a new topic at that point. But if the spouse listens and expresses empathy and then offers advice, the conversation is much more likely to go well because both people will feel satisfied when they both feel listened to. And that's our goal in a nutshell, to facilitate conversations where people feel listened to and understood even under challenging conditions. So let me tell you a story about a nurse I worked with recently, and this happened about six months ago at an inpatient hospice in Delaware. This nurse, Dan, walked into a room with a new patient, a man in his 50s who was in a coma and was unable to communicate. And Dan had a list of things to go over with the family, medical history, medications. But at one point, he turned to the patient's wife and daughter and said, tell me something personal about him. And the wife struggled with that question. But the daughter said, I know exactly what to say. He's a great dad. And Dan wrote that down. And then he told that story to the rest of the staff. And this created a pattern where every, any staff member that entered the room had a starting point. They could talk about the patient as a dad. And when you start with something that's important to the patient and the family, conversations about values and goals get much, much easier. And I think we can all recognize that this is the kind of care that we want for ourselves, the kind of care where we get treated as people. We call it person-centered care, but what it really means is that you enter into a conversation with me as a person, with all the complex and messy and beautiful things that go along with that. Because in those conversations, we learn how to care for each other. I learn what kind of music you like. You might learn what scares me. I might learn what you're sure about. And you might learn what I'm not so sure about. And that only happens in great conversations. But that kind of conversation just doesn't happen very often. And the problem is, we're scared to have those conversations. We're scared to ask personal questions. We're nervous to bring up embarrassing topics about ourselves. Many of us struggle to have these kinds of conversations with our own family, so it's not a big surprise that we struggle to have them with nurses and doctors. So on the topic of these person-centered conversations, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is we actually know a lot about what kinds of behaviors improve these conversations. Things like the study I mentioned earlier about work stress and advice. Communication researchers have a lot to say about what makes for better conversations, conversations where people feel safe sharing personal information, conversations where people feel listened to. I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples of the kinds of things we know about these behaviors. Groups that take turns speaking and pay attention to nonverbal cues are more likely to successfully navigate conversations about embarrassing, sensitive, or personal topics. So there are some specific behaviors that improve conversations. 
Here's another. People are often dissatisfied in conversations where there isn't a good balance between talking about three topics. The task of the conversation, maybe a question about a symptom or a treatment. The relationships, affirming a bond between people, for instance. And their own identities, things like expressing autonomy, for example. But when you do balance those three things, when you pay attention to what researchers call the task, relational, and identity goals, people are much more satisfied with their conversations. So that's the good news. We know a lot about what works. Here's the bad news. A minute ago, I told you one way that you could improve your relationships. Just resist that impulse to give advice about work stress. And that's a relatively simple one. And now that you know it, you will never jump in and give advice at the beginning of that conversation again, right? Right? Of course you will. That's just not how behavior change works. Knowing what to do and doing it are two entirely different things. You can ask my wife. I still struggle not to jump in with advice at the beginning of that conversation. And I've read the study. So why don't I just start with listening every time? Well. Maybe I had a hard day at work, too, or maybe I'm tired, or maybe I'm human. And changing those behaviors, especially in the moment, is a lot more challenging than we'd like to believe. So unfortunately, I have one other bit of bad news. The things that make conversations go well are mostly things that one person can't do on their own. Conversations are a team event. They require everyone working together. To work better as a team, we need to give people a different kind of solution, one that doesn't depend on every person knowing what behaviors lead to better conversations, and one that doesn't depend on everyone changing those behaviors while they're under stress. That means tools that people use together, tools that sit between people and moderate the conversation itself. I'm going to share two examples of tools that we've developed to do that. The first is this game we designed called Hello. We originally released this a few years ago under the name My Gift of Grace. It's designed to moderate the kinds of behaviors I talked about earlier. It encourages taking turns and listening, and the game prompts players to talk about those task, relational, and identity goals that are essential to great conversations. And just to make it a little more sticky, it's fun. If you haven't played the game, that might be a little bit hard to believe. It's a game about serious and illness and death, and it's fun to play. But you can ask anybody who has played the game, or you can read the study that backs that up. It works with kids. It works with families. It works with caregivers. It works with patients. It works with large groups. It works with small groups. In fact, we've played with up to 150 people at events. It works because it's a tool that manages the hard parts of a conversation so that players can relax and be themselves. And it turns out when people feel good about these conversations, that leads to action. In a study that came out earlier this year, 78% of people who played the game went on to take an advanced care planning action. And that result has been reproduced in two additional studies with different populations. There's no magic here. This is what happens when you give people a simple tool that nudges everyone toward better conversational behaviors. OK, so here's the other example. That story I told at the beginning about Dan, the hospice nurse, I left out a couple of key details. The first is that Dan had actually played our game with the rest of his staff over and over until they got comfortable with this kind of person-centered conversation. And then we worked with the staff to design a new tool for use with patients and families. So when Dan walked into the room that day, he used that tool to start a conversation. It takes question 11 from our game and inserts it into the middle of a standard patient interaction. Here's how the tool gets introduced. And the tool looks like this. The staff member will say, I want to ask you a question that I think will help us provide you with better care. And it's a question that we ask every patient and one that every staff member here has answered for themselves. And that statement normalizes the experience for everyone. Then they read the question on the card. In order to provide you with the best care possible, what three non-medical facts should your doctor know about you? And then the answer gets written directly on the card. So in that case, Dan took the card and wrote, he's a great dad. And then the card goes up on the wall above the hand washing station. 
so that every doctor, nurse, janitor, social worker, family member, friend sees that card. They get a nudge to talk about this patient as a person every time they enter the room. So there are videos on our website where you can hear the staff talk for themselves about what happens when you do this with every single patient that you encounter, and I'll let you hear more from them if you're interested. But I'm gonna end with this. Healthcare organizations don't just tell their staff about the importance of hand washing and then expect them to find a way to disinfect their hands. They give them simple tools and make them widely available. We should be using tools for great conversations as often as we use tools for better hand washing because conversations are just that important to providing better care and they deserve to be treated that way. Thanks.